I've been told by everybody up on this roof that they're all off the roof. I am on the roof of Explosion 4. Got fire through the roof of the fire building in the entire rear section. Please, now remember given the payday. Has you been accounted for? Okay. 610B, now is the main date. 610B. I'm out uh, here. We got a fire. One and a half story, single family dwelling. Fire shown from the second floor. Give me a second alarm on this. See up there, the top floor. I got people hanging out the top floor windows with a baby. Commercial building, uh, a lot of fire, a lot of smoke. Go ahead and strike a third alarm on my orders on this. Got people on the front fire escape here with windows sensors below them. We need somebody up there. Yeah, let them know we got a job. I'm pulling up now. Second alarm, I got a one story single family frame. Heavy fire showing from the attic. So we're using all hands. We got one line stretch, fire on the fourth floor. Second line being stretched. Primary stretches are underway. Hey, welcome back to Old School. I'm Chief Rick Lasky, along with my good buddy and partner, Chief John Salka, and we've got another great show for you. Um, lots of stuff in the world right now going on, John. Um, we got a train derailment uh, where they, they actually purposely, if you will, lit the place off to get rid of, you know, the bad chemicals that were in there. So right, the, you right. know, anticipating or expecting possibly an explosion, trying to alleviate that. Exactly. And they were able to do, I mean, I think that, you know, talking to my buddies and everything else, they were able to do that pretty successfully and keep that poison as far as they could. They evacuated, you know, all that. I mean, they. I'm telling you, you know, now I wasn't there, you know, on the scene, but I've been talking with my buddy Cole pretty for, you know, for a bunch and uh, everything I've been seeing, they, those guys have done a remarkable job. Right. Um, those are gigantic sort of multi-dimensional situations that it's hard to even get a perimeter around or anything. And you want oh. to keep the emergency work. There's very little really the fire department can do with 20 or 30 cars all ruptured and on fire and stuff like that. So it is a difficult thing to do. You want to get there and handle it, but you don't want to get too close. And you want to basically end up reverting to getting the, getting the, the citizenry. Getting getting the the people away from you know that live in the community. Exactly. I mean, and, and again, you know, and, and my buddy, I was saying, my buddy Cody Cole has been like giving me updates and stuff. He's been out there as guys, and you know, just thoughts and prayers with them because they've had so much in the way of chemical fallout on the apparatus and their gear. And you know, w one of the things we've always talked about is um, is this whole uh, pretend thing that we do. You know, we do incidents, we do, you know, incident command you know, scenarios. Oh, we were talking about that. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's like, okay, the boulder rolls down out of the mountains and runs over the tanker that, you know, that runs it. I mean, blah, blah, blah. Right. Then hits a church that's having a wedding. And then, uh, you and know, then, right, right. yeah. And then you look at this and go, there it is. And then some, I mean, this is, I mean, from the, and, and the reason we said it was, you said, Oh, and I got to work in fire today too. What are the chances? And I, I think they oh. said it was a 4,000 person community. We're talking about a small little village, right? A gigantic tra train derailment, fire, and hazmat release. Twenty-four hours later, a work and structural fire. What's the chances of, of you know two events like that occurring in a small town? Exactly, and this is John. You just said it. Yeah, you know, I guess the point I'd like to grab from that is it can happen anywhere. Right. You know, to those that think, oh, that stuff only happens in the big urban areas. There's been a ton of train derailments with, with significant, you know, in the way of hazards. Um, you know, derailed. In rural areas, most in areas. rural areas, yeah, yeah, it's just and so your your mutual aid, your automatic aid, your mutual aid, um, your 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 office of emergency management people having a big plan, your disaster management, you know, and, and I mean all this stuff, every bit of it, your your relationship with law enforcement, both local and state and county, your EMS, everything, and with the railroads, oh. you get these these major corporations, these major railroad companies that run. You know, run lines through small communities and densely populated communities. Got to be able to get a hold of them rapidly and find out, you know, you know what what's on these trains and what what could be burning and what the hazards are. You know. Well, and I was always amazed. You know, me being a big hazmat geek, you know, to be able to see in Bedford Park just how they put the the trains together, the switching yard, the big switching yards. We used to call them the steel crickets because all night long you'd hear e, and that was the the brakes they were putting on the wheels. So several hundred tracks on each side come together from the north and the south all over you know the, the all these all these trains come in and then the locos pull them all apart and then they start building the next train right so they they take those and they grab a hold of one of those cars you know and they push it up this this hill in this case and then they get to the top they let it go and the guys up in the switching office up there they go they start moving it they goes from track two to track seven to track 12 to track rolling two, downhill down. right yeah and they're slowing it down with their brakes and all of a sudden they slow it down enough to where the couplings and a bang in here, bam, and the cu the couplings couple together, right? And and th that's why you see on some of the hazardous materials, tank cars, 
do not hump because that's called humping in the rail industry when they they hump them together they do that right so, so they have sensitive stuff or whatever on board well, they don't want to do and that happened when i was there i remember telling that story where we had the the same products it was during the uh exxon valdez you know that big incident um they they you know I think somebody got lazy and they pushed a couple, two or three silica sand hoppers cars down there. And they, they, I think they said it slid on some fat or some grease on the track. But what ended up happening was they came out with such force that the coupling didn't stop with just coupling. It went and it went boom and it punched a hole in the tank car and blew it. Huh. We had a fireball in the sky. We were there for a week. Somebody lost dealing with that. there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so you've got that. So you're putting all the trains together. And then when you're done, you know, they push the the guy up in the office pushes the print button and he prints the rail constants. It's everything from the loco back to the you know the cabooses, the red flash line, all those different things they have. You know, back through there, all the different cars, the way bills, all the things that tell you what's in each one. So where do you get those from? You get those from you know we talk about the engineer conductor. You know, if people confuse that between the two of them, but you get just like from you get get the the bill lading you would get from like good luck when the train runs off the track well, and everything's on fire. Right? Exactly. You know, you get that from the truck driver and the, the you know, the air bill from the plane and the way. So anyway, just like you said, and her hoping in most cases that maybe the locos did dislodge and we're talking somewhere in the middle or towards the end, but you never know. So let's let's talk about this. This is a major, you know, major it's a large scale incident bringing all these different agencies. Next row, when you get done with that from all over the country, not just that region. And every one of them needs to work with the other one right. in the group to make right. this happen. You have to put their egos aside. Both public and private, police oh. and fire and emergency management and the railroad and the landowners and, and you know, who knows the people that own the property that yeah. the crash is on. Oh, think about think about everything going into it from, first of all, you have to feed everybody that's out there. We have to, we have to, we have to be, you know, thinking uh, restrooms, porta potties, all that kind of stuff, command centers, you know, communication, everything, everything needs to be. Oh, you, you got to look downwind. There might be a farms down there. There might be cattle. There might be all sorts of stuff that, that that needs protection as well. There might be crops that are growing a mile away that now are now now are uh, soiled and 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 exactly you know unfit. The environmental concerns. Oh I mean, yeah, you and I could go on and on. This guy should be another show talking about this. But I guess what I wanted to get to is is um, let let's talk about you know like pre planning incident like that and 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 listen now one of our one of our listeners George. I think it's Vaut, Vauter, okay, V A U T E R. George, I'm sorry if I messed up your name, but but George sent us a while back, uh, actually back in November. We get so many of these guys, uh, kind of a little, hey, could you guys talk about this? You a know, little, little topic suggestion, which we welcome. Yeah, and you know, he, he's talking about you know whether he, you know he's on a volunteer department uh, north of Indianapolis, Indianapolis, and you know some places out there they're rolling out a new new pre planned soft, software system. And, you know, some, what are some of the options, you know, different people look for in, in what you set up? Because the software is there. Some of them will do a ton of it. Some of it is restricted. Um, you know, I've always said that, you know, if, if somebody would make a CAD system for the fire department, like they do for law enforcement, God bless our cops, because we're always the afterthought, you'd be a millionaire. Well, the same thing when it comes to the pre-planning software, because what's being made out there is by a bunch of people, unfortunately, sometimes, not all of them. There's some great vendors out there, creators, but a lot of them are just in a hurry to put something together and they've never been in an incident, you know, and they listen to a couple of people, they hurry up and put stuff in there. And then, and then it's like, it doesn't work. It, it doesn't, you know, it's, it, it's not something at times where I can sit there and take 25 minutes to go through it. There are some incidents we'll talk about that we can. So, let, let's how about we spend some time talking about pre-planning i mean we can start and, with just talking about pre-planning in general to start with the concept of pre-planning how important that is and it's, exactly right. and the software and we'll talk a little bit about the software so let, let me ask you this so let's let's talk let, let's talk first of all the importance of pre-plans john right. now you have said i always i always kind of sn snag you a little bit and drag you into talking about this one thing you always talk about when it comes to pre-plans. Right. I've been right. quoted, I've been quoted many times saying exactly exactly those those words that the first time you're in a building shouldn't be the day that it's on fire, right? We all go to fire. Some of us go to fires more frequently than others. Some of us go to a lot of jobs in big buildings, commercial buildings, multiple dwellings, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> but the point is whether it's whether it's 
you know, the little mom and pop grocery store, whether it's a hardware store on Main Street downtown, whether it's a big six story multiple dwelling with commercial res, you know, with occupancies on the first floor, or or any one of hundreds of other types of occupancies and buildings, no matter what it is, you gotta know your buildings. You gotta know your buildings. You gotta know where you're going. We've all talked about that, and and it, and you shouldn't be bumbling around in the smoke in in a in a hardware store that has a, a secret stairway in the back for employees only, and a, and a and a truck loading ramp on the on the left side behind a roll down door that you don't know was there if you didn't shop there regularly. So you know, pre fire planning is getting into these structures, getting into these buildings, checking them out, walking through them, seeing what they have. Noting that down. Now, what you do with that information, there's a lot of choices. Like, like the FDNY has the SIDS, right. SIDS, SIDS program, right? It's through CAD. It's, it's through your dispatch system. And you can write down stuff like, you know, the hardware store is, is connected internally, the, the, you know, w- with the storage building next door. They bought the storage building and they keep a lot of their extra stuff there. And you know what? You don't have to go outside or go through the garage door. In, inside the building, these two separate addresses that were building 40 years apart, they, they, they're interconnected and you can write that and they'll even come up on CAD 123 and 126 interconnected on the first floor in the rear. So that's one thing you can do right off the bat. You can just familiarize your firefighters with the buildings that they're going to go and fight fires in or, or have emergencies well, in or whatever. So let me ask you, it's, it's, now it's easy, obviously for you and I to sit here and talk about the importance of pre plans. What do you say to the firefighters on the line? How do you, how do you emphasize the importance of, you know, most of the company officers, most of them will buy into it and they'll go, okay, this is pretty important because it's going to help them make decisions. But when you when you get the troops out there and are they just walking, going through the motions, not paying attention? Or what, what are you telling them to sell them on the whole thought process? You, you already said the first time you're in that building should be when it's on fire. You should already been through that. All right. They heard that and they go, okay, thanks, Chief. I appreciate that. But what do you say to the firefighter about, you know, you brought up a couple scenarios now. How do you how do you get the buy in to get them to go? You know what, this is pretty important stuff. I mean, right off the bat, I mean, I use my my own example in the FDNY. I spent thirty three years there, both as a lieutenant and a captain. You know, doing building inspection. We called it BI. They call it different things at different times in my career, uh, and it doesn't matter what you call it. We're still talking about familiarization. We're talking about getting inside buildings and and looking around and and knowing, learning our buildings before we get in there to to fight a fire. So so I always come back to the company officer. The company officer. Now, the FDNY happens to have a, 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 a very dynamic, established building inspection program, and they've called it, as I said, different things over the years, but it's very well documented. There are drawers, you know, file cabinets full of building cards, which are not very big, and, and each building that exists in that district has a building card, has the address, and it's got 20 different lines on it. And you can pick up a building card and look back to 1967 and see what lieutenant was working. A, g- a guy that's probably dead by now. He not only not only is he not working anymore, he's retired, he's probably passed away. You can see what date this building was inspected every year for the past 20 years, just looking at the card. Then in another file drawer, there's a manila folder with that same address on it that has the paperwork that we fell out. We have established pre-printed forms for multiple dwelling inspection form factory inspection form, uh, you know, uh, retail, you know, stores inspection form. And they all have different things, all the local laws and the requirements for how, why the aisles have to be and whether they have, the sprinkler has to be locked open in position and it, that, that, that house cleaning and the stairs are not obstructed by debris and stuff like that, that the exit doors are all unlocked and, and a proper width. The point is you don't have to, you don't have to be an ACE. You don't have to be a fire prevention specialist or an inspector. You can just walk through as an ordinary firefighter through a multiple dwelling with the multiple dwelling inspection form, fill it out manually with your pen. I'm sure eventually it's going to get to be electronic with some kind of a, a, a tablet. Pen, but, yeah. but the point is you can go through it. And then when you get back, you can file that paper. And, and if something is, is improper, according to the form, the form calls for three, three foot wide aisles in a hardware store. If they're not three foot wide, you, you go talk to the owner and say, you know what? They're not three foot wide. Or you know what? You can't put those stands of products, those little displays down the aisle like they do sometimes in supermarkets, right? And you give them a violation order, or you might even in the FDNY give them a warning and say, you know what? We're going to come back in one week. This all stuff has to be clear. And if it's all clear, you you you, you negate it. And the, and the guy's good. But in the meantime, we're walking around looking. And, and we're passively learning the layouts of these stores, how the aisles run. Hey, hey, Billy, look at this. There's a little hatch here. This goes down to the basement. That must be when they load stuff from the truck. They can they can run it right down here instead of walking up to the front of the store where the big stairway is. You know. So this brings it back to the enthusiasm and passion of the company officer, the lieutenant or captain. 
that's anybody go, okay, the chief wants us to do it. I know. Exactly. You know, Motivate get, his guys. Come on, guys. Let's get inside this hardware. Yeah. I shopped here the other day for something. You got to see what they got downstairs. And all of a sudden, they are downstairs. And guys are down at, I mean, especially a hardware store. What fireman doesn't want to go on a hardware store, right? <laughs> but, but even if it was a supermarket, you know, I, I wrote an article a couple of years back about know your buildings. And one of the things I wrote was, wherever you live, forget the supermarket in the city or the town, wherever you work or wherever you volunteer, but where you live. I said, who has been in the supermarket where they live and has gone through those double swinging doors where you see them coming out once in a while with a cart to put fresh vegetables and fruit out? Right. Who's ever gone back there to see what's back there? And a lot of guys say, gee, I never really did. I never really did stray back there to see what's back there. You know, the, you know, the truck bay behind the supermarket, the two or three truck bays empty into that area. They don't empty into the aisles. You don't see the back of a truck in any of the aisles. So there's so much stuff to know, even in simple places that we're in all the time. You're in super, I'm in a supermarket where I live at home three times a week, at least. So Never mind the firehouse being in introduce every day. smoke into that building and or fire. Right. And everything changes because if you don't know. If you don't know, I could I could walk through the supermarket of my town, stop and shop with my eyes closed. I, I could tell you what products I'm looking at. I don't know where the pickles are. I know where the, I know where the oatmeal is. I know where the, you know, but not when you get to the back room or not when you get maybe to the hardware store, which you're not in so much, or, or, or maybe the, you know, the deli where you go in once in a while for a sandwich and stuff. So that's just the introduction of getting the companies into it and collecting the information. Now, you know, we, we're talking about, you know, hardware and software. We're talking about where can we enter this stuff into that make, to make it available to us. I just mentioned cards and files in the, in the file drawers. We don't bring them with us on runs. Now, when you go on a run, you want to have some of this stuff available. We do that SIDS, critical information dispatch system. But I mean, I know places that are small and don't don't even have CAD. You know what they have? They get a little spiral notebook on the dashboard of their apparatus yeah. in their little town, in their little village of 12,000 people. And they have just little alphabet tabs, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, down, the, down the, the side. And for every street that starts with A, it's listed on the A page. Every street that starts with B. So if they're going to 21 Baxter Street for a report of a fire in the factory, they go to the B page, open it up. And when they get to Baxter, there's nothing written there. They're good. But if they go out on a on a fire or if they do a building inspection or a familiarization walkthrough and they find out, you know what? Holy crap, this place on Baxter, they got guard dogs on the roof. They're there 24-7. Now you write that down there. And then the day you go in there for a fire call, you can get on the radio and say, a ladder one to ladder one roof. Yeah, hey, be careful up there. Remember, there's guard dogs up there. And it's just really pen to paper. It's something small. It's very primitive, but it can still be effectively used by a small volunteer or even a small career department that, that doesn't have a an advanced CAD system. Well, and, and you know, look, you and I, we love uh, Dingus Fire, the, the Dingus Fire Company, Illinois. We love, you know, Nick and, and Jeff, Jeff, right? And, oh my God, what a great, what a great company. And they have done so much for us. We don't mind mentioning them, but you know, there's a lot <laughs> of software companies producing, you know, CAD and pre plan Some of it's tied together. Some of it's a separate, you know, there's all different versions, and right. and we don't have any enough time to. And we're them. not here to endorse. No, no, we're not here. So let me let me ask you this: without without endorsing a particular product, like I said before, if you want to be a millionaire, build a CAD system that works for the fire department too. If you want to, be, which you know, we we had some friends up at Coeur d'Alene do that, and they did a great job. And you've talked it. very positively about because it. Yeah. I couldn't break it, and they they said they go, we got tired of everybody else's stuff breaking on us, so we built our own. But that being said. So let let's let's wind things back a second, okay? So you're you're a captain in an engine, in your city or wherever, okay? And it, it's two in the morning. You you get up in the rig. You've got your gear. You're slinging your air pack straps, you know, shoulder straps over your thing, and you look over at your MCT computer, and you see all you know the call information, location stuff. Hey, they got a hydrogen service. The normal stuff you'd see through CAD, and there's a button on there for pre plan, okay? And it's, you know, so the address is already there. Everything's tied together. Uh, 123 Main Street. And you push that button as the company officer. You know, and we've talked about this before. Where, and, and tell me if you agree or disagree, where you almost want the layers. You know, I've always said I want layers because the company officer, especially the first one out the door, if you will, because it's still, who's ever still district that incident is, doesn't have 20 minutes to read like a, a, a book. Okay. They've got to be able to glance at, look at it, and they need to be able to hit and identify certain things right now that they need. Right. Now, Chief Salka jumps in the buggy and he responds to the battalion chief. He needs to see that same layer, that same information, 
but you know, he's going to need a little bit more as the inside commander. So he needs to go to like that and then page two, like the layers, one, two. Right. And then. All right, right. And the first one for the company officer just might be an overhead graphic. Of, well, what, of the layout. Let me ask you, what do you, what do you, what would you expect? What would you like to see? You got in there, you're rubbing your eyes, or it's two o'clock, two in the morning, two in the afternoon. You get in there and you press pre-plan on that on NMC on a computer, and boom, it pops up there for that address. Right. What what is the captain or lieutenant would you want to see? Right, as you said, in addition to the address and stuff like that, maybe the closest hydrant. That's stuff that's just going to come with CAD anyway. That's that's just stuff that's going to come with, with with the run. But what what additionally, I would like to see some type of an overhead an overhead graphic or layout. So you can look at the building from overhead like there was no roof on it, and you can see, okay, there's the front door right there. When we walk in, we're in a big entry hall, and then, oh, there's a whole line of offices back there, and then look at this. There's truck bays over here with trucks in it. You, know, you, can, you can see a lot of stuff visually that's included on there without having to get into reading stuff. You could just have a nice graphic, you know? It, additionally, you might want to see sprinkler protection, Siamese here with an arrow, Siamese to, you know, to, to put water into a let's say a stamp pipe or a sprinkler system. Um, maybe you want to know what type of construction this thing is. Is this a lightweight building? Is this a new modern steel building with steel bar joists on the roof? Or is this a, a lightweight, uh, maybe, a, maybe a cinder block building, masonry with, with wood, with lightweight wood joists on Light the roof? Lightweight or a, tr a bowstring truss or right. whatever. Or whatever it is, the point is now you know it. That education comes separately. You have to know about building so, construction. So you'd want to see, if you're going to 123 Main Street, if you're going to the front of the building, I want to be looking. Here's my address. Here's my address side. I'm looking at the building, and like you said, oh my God! In the back, I forgot. They not only do they have loading docks, they actually they have they have bays. They can back those trucks inside and close the door. So I have I have box trucks or whatever, you know, that are inside there with fuel. To, you know, in this. Area. I mean, listen. There's a thousand things we could say. You could look at it, and the back could say you, the, the back of the building could be five feet from a bulkhead. It could drop off into a little waterway. That, that barges come up and down. Right. You know what I'm saying? There may be no access to the rear for apparatus at all, or you need to know that when you go out the back door, you take five steps and, and you're in the river. It's you know? nice to know where the announcer panel is. So you got, you know, any alarm controls, you know, right. regarding the building. Right. Like you Sprinkler said, shut FPTs, off. Not only is Siamese off. putting water in, but when you get inside the building, you know what? We got a truck on fire inside this building. It set off a couple of sprinkler heads. Tommy, go turn it off. Oh, where's that cap? Oh, straight back. Three offices back. The, the sprinkler control's in there. Why? Because you saw it on the graphic when this whole thing started, you know? And maybe, and, and one more thing is for that first layer, maybe just maybe I want to see something like that that needs to jump out of me. Some hazard that, you know, aside from they have a flammable liquids cabinet over, cabinet over here. I mean, maybe there's something that they manufacture, something they store, something that's in there oh. that needs to be like a red blinking clown nose. Tell right. me, the, the back left corner has got 55 gallon drums full of ethyl methyl bad shit, whatever right. it might be. Right. right, right. So that, so that, that, that's the first layer. And you know, look, everybody's going to have different desires. And just like we talked about spec and apparatus, when you're looking at this first layer in your pre-planned system, whatever you use, whether it's that notebook or it's actually something in a, a software system, that first page needs to be something I can get to now quick. I can see two in the morning, two in the afternoon, boom, bing, bing, boom, boom, because I'm already turning the corner. And, and you have to. That's right. You got a three minute response, and guess what? The response is over. You, you, you're walking away from the tablet. Now. Exactly. Right. So you, I need I need those pretty things. So some people, like we said, when you're specking apparatus, spec it for your city or your still districts specifically. You can have a, a city with different needs and desires for different right. engines because of neighborhoods. Well, the same thing. Your department may need. Some things that we didn't even mention on there because you're mainly maybe you're heavy industrial or you're primary residential or you're mixed or whatever you know what I'm saying high rise or no high rise or you're rural and, yeah. and you got a million square foot warehouse in a rural area which is what they're building where I live up in Orange County there's not a hydrant for three miles near that building but it's a million square feet full of stuff guess what there's there's tactical there's operation there's there's water supply right. requirements now. You know, any sign of fire, call for a, a, a tanker task force. You know what I'm saying? Because you have to, because there's no other way to fight that fire. So that's that first layer. That, right. That's Captain Salter. Company officer. Company officer jumping in the engine, and off you go. And this is what I want to see. It, it, it is, it's not even three minutes, because you don't have three minutes, because you jumped in a rig. And you get and dressed. You're, and you're fighting your seatbelt. That's right. You're, you're, getting, you're talking you're, to your chauffeur. Slow down a little bit, Billy. And putting your air pack on. You're talking on the radio. You're clearing intersections for them. You know, hey, you're clearing the right, blah, 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 so, so right. forth. And you're looking at this computer the whole time, trying to get little glances, little bits of information. And you pull up and off you go. Right. Now your battalion chief, Salka. 
coming, you know, two minutes, three minutes behind that. Yeah, from, from headquarters or your your headquarters, right, your station right. for that. So now let's talk layer number two. That was the first layer for the company officer. Let's talk layer number two. As a battalion chief, we already know, talked about all your a lot of, chief and a volunteer. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. The, the chief. We talked about the company officer and what they need in a very rapid, you know, very short amount of time. Very, we need some clear, concise, boom, boom, boom. Jump out of me, throw me some stuff, and I'm gone. Now the chief's going. Whether it's a volley, you know, volunteer chief, right. uh, like I said, a, a district, whatever chief officer. It's got maybe a couple more minutes. This is the middle layer. All right, we got the company officer, and we've had now. As a battalion chief, what may be a couple more things that you could think of that, that would pop into your head? So, you see, now what I'd like to do as a battalion chief, I would still go to page one. I would still look at what the company also looked at. Because right. I want to look at that same close-up graphic or overhead of the building right. and see what the rooms are and where the sign and stuff like that. And then, think you hit the button, you get to page two, which is for the chief officer to look at. Now, now it looks like the camera zooms out a little bit. Now you can see that same building in the middle. But all of a sudden, you can see exposure two or four or, or B and D, boy and dog, as you would call it. And now you can say, wow, look at that. There's a whole depot right next to this place on the left, connected, actually touching each other. And on the right-hand side is, you know, a yard, a shipbuilding yard where they do some steel work and some welding and stuff like that. And, and they get some flammable liquid tanks in it, which the company also may not even have looked at because he's looking more at or where, where he's a, walking. Ace Ventura's into. pool supply company. You know exactly. People, so yeah. you get two different hazards on now your exposed buildings, which are not involved yet, but certainly could be if this thing gets out of hand or turns into a working fire. How about a taxpayer? How about how about people living upstairs over the hardware store? Oh, absolutely. That, that you know, I mean. So now, like you said, you have that second level of information. You could not and should not expect a company officer, a first arriving officer, to start absorbing 10, 12, 15 pieces of information about different levels of exposed buildings right. and stuff like that. Maybe at a quick glance, but other than that, so now we're looking at. A more of a more of a strategic uh, well because you're putting people on the floors right they're going to a specific area but you're going okay i need a second line here i need a search crew here i need them on the roof i need this i need roof you know again we're going from a single unit responding with the company officer and what they need to know right now you said bc looks at that same first page clicks again hits it again and boom pulls up another layer that adds to that with it's like somebody flipped a transparency in the old days a piece of exactly. paper right over it some more strategic information like i said involving the exposures involving some other hazardous situations maybe in a greater distance away or maybe like you said maybe elevations maybe it gives you not an overhead view necessarily looking through the, the roof being removed and looking at, at the layout but now maybe it also gives you maybe a frontal view of the first floor and the second floor and there's an area above so those are things you might want to consider as well it, it, there could even be and i don't want to jump too far ahead but that same chief then could even go to a third. Well, let's page. well let, let, let's talk about that. We talked about the first layer for the company officer. We, however, you do this, folks. Whether you like I said, I'll say it again. Whether you do it in a three ring binder, or you do it in a, a, a regular computer, a tablet, tablet software, right. whatever. Right. Your first layer that you got the quick information for the company officer. The second layer for the battalion chief, the chief officer responding. Expanded. Now, now you get there and you're running your incident, and this thing's going to hell in a handcart. It's going sideways pretty quick, and now. You know, now we're we're thinking everything from environmental concerns to a block long versus a single occupant. You know, I was talking about this oxygen and maybe exposure on each side to everything from I got a school on the next block. You know, all the all these water things. runoff into that creek or that river that we talked about before because of the school supply plant, the pool supply. So now you might be talking, you know. Consider towel out of in 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 lot in the lot next door at the pool supply place. Consider a hazmat team diking the uh, bulkhead behind the fire building runoff. and the pool supply for runoff in case the the water from the fighting the fire uh, starts to wash some you know hazardous materials towards the river. You want to protect well, the you river. You said the right? river. I mean, knowing which way it's flowing, knowing if there's a dam, knowing. I mean, this is all stuff that should have been pre-planned ahead of time. But now, look, you can't remember every single south. I don't care how good you are, every single note about what's going on and that's that, why and you have it on a screen that's why you yeah. have it on a tablet you hit it you can even put your fingers on it my, my my kids when they were young even my granddaughter right now she knows to put her two fingers together and then to separate them on the screen and that that zooms in on the screen right and you can do that too you can zoom in zoom in zoom in and say wow look at this we even have what products from the pool supply are stored on the wall against the hardware store and you still have the stuff that's on the inside of the home depot you can see what's stored on on the on that exposure side, the dog side of the Home Depot, which is against 
the what? The so, boy side of the fire building, right? So you've been on some huge large scale incidents in New York City. All right. Talk, talk what are some of the things that you and your command team and when the big the deputies get there and all the all the big all the stars and bars and all those people show up. Well, you know, once you get to large, large, large scale operations, obviously water supply is an important thing, what, but it's water in, water out, right? Where are you going to get the water from? New York City generally has no water supply problems at all. We have ample water to provide any fire we need, but everybody doesn't have that. So the minute you start to, as I think I mentioned earlier, up in Orange County where I live, they have million square foot warehouses with, with 46 or 56 truck bays to back into and there's not a hydrant within, you know, five miles of the place, right? Now, some of them actually put their own little water supply with their, with their own private hydrant system. Still not going to be able to, to, to suffice for large-scale operation. So sometimes people have to start thinking about that if they don't have unlimited hydrants and unlimited water like big cities have. So that's one problem you've got to think about. The second one is water in and water out. You, you know, the more water you put in there, that's wonderful. you got to make sure you have good water runoff depending on the age of the building and the construction type and how many floors. I've been to many buildings where the deputy sent you know, a rescue company or a truck company in after they shut the outside streams down at an out-of-control fire and sent people in to say, just check the... I bit the fires where the water was the water was up to the windowsill. Yeah. The water's three and a half feet deep on the second floor, up to the windowsill, rolling over the windowsill like a waterfall. That's 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 unacceptable. You know, The fact that that could happen, you have to pay attention to that as well. Um, obviously, resources are important. Smaller fire departments or or county fire departments that consist of lots of smaller departments have to coordinate, you know, covering stations and bringing the type of apparatus they need in. New York City doesn't. New York City says, uh, Battalion 1 8 to Manhattan, go ahead. You know, Battalion 9 to Manhattan, send me two more towel ladders, two more area ladders, and get me the satellite system here. Bink, it's done. If you have mutual aid that you have to call different departments in, that becomes problematic as well. So a smaller department one might want to build that into their pre fire plans. For any working fire, Initiate the second alarm, which will bring in, you know, additional engine and tanker from Stormville and a towel out of from, you know, Wrightsville and, and Monroe. You know, so what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing, if I'm, if I'm hearing this right, you know, is there, there's, there's two sides to this whole pre-plan thing. One is, what do I need to know to respond to the incident and get there and operate safely? First one through the door. Right. Okay. Now part two of this is it's one thing to just draw pictures of the building, do your stuff and everything else. Now there's part two that we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna dovetail into it of where do I get the water? Where do I get this? Where do I get that? Where do I you know all these you know like I said it's it's one thing to have just that here it all is vital information, but now there I guess one's kind of static the other one is is dynamic is dynamic right. where it's like okay now we have this enter into the picture a fire hazmat or whatever right. or the collapse building now we have to turn and we have to look at the rest of this stuff. People get things. And this may turn into interagency uh, situation because, again, like New York City, it's one agency. The whole the whole fire department is one agency. It's five it's five boroughs, five counties, 300 companies. We, we, we don't have to worry about that. But a lot of places do. Even fire departments well, with 10, 12, 15 stations, sometimes on the west side, they, they got to have one of the west side neighbors come in and help them. So when you're worried about water supply, when you're worried about tankers, when you're worried about maybe towel ladders in case you got to go to an exterior operation, you got to have... Yeah, gotta have preformed, pre pre decided upon right. agreements with your neighboring departments. But I'll just say this: FDNY Chicago are kind of. If you erase the door decals on the side, you got you've got engines, you have ladders, you know, top, you know, truck companies, you have rescues and squads, but you have a marine unit, you have a hazmat unit, you have a technical. Re I mean, absolutely, you, know, you got a rescue. I mean, you have actually, just what you said for some of these departments have to think to their neighbors. Even though it's one agency, you're one agency that has many divisions. So right. it's almost like, you know, kind of same, same, if you will. But my whole point is, if you're not, like you just said, it, if you're not thinking about it ahead of time, it ain't going to happen when it's happening. Good luck that night. Oh, Good God. luck that night figuring out, hey, Billy, you know, this is the chief talking to his assistant chief. Hey, Billy, what chief? Who's got that? Who's got that big towel out? I'm getting any more towel, towel ladders to the west. Any communities to the west have a towel ladder? Hold on a second. Let me look. Then he starts looking through some paperwork. Instead of having this all pre-documented, all ready to go, either through the dispatcher or through your or through your own program, you know, in, integrated program in your own fire department, you should know that. You should have looked at that and said, if we go to a third alarm, then then these are the people going to call. If we go to a fourth alarm, 
then these are the people we're going to call. And they know it. And they know, okay, you guys are on our fourth alarm box. We're going to call you a towel out of Hey, guys, wow, pay we're attention. Far from you. Yeah, but we may need pay you. Pay attention. Have you ever listened to what's going on over there? Yes, we're probably going next. Exactly. So that, that's the real value of pre-fire planning is it takes a lot of the burden of making decisions and researching resources. It takes it away from the fire. It takes it away from you doing it the night of the fire, and it's already established. All you do is press that next button. Mutual aid scenarios. Bing, bing, bing. Okay, good. Yeah, go with the third alarm. Look, that gives us two more towel ladders and two more tankers. That was already thought about. That was already pre-planned. You already got permission and the okay from those departments that are going to provide those things to you. And I, all you got to do is, like I said, press that button about resources available. Yeah, go with the third, Tommy. Look, it gives us four more tankers and two more towel ladders. That's exactly what we need right now. Good. And now you just press a button because you put the time in earlier. Right. Pre-planning, visiting, getting permission exploring resources and now you're ready to go the night of the fire and you concentrate on what holy crap now to get fire in the rear exposure too you know all right so as we kind of close things out here on this thing we we you know we start off talking about a large-scale incident right now with a train derailment and all the things oh my god that they were dealing with and that's in ohio right oh, ohio yeah, near pennsylvania yeah. oh my god yes so so that being said you know and i'll just say this to our listeners if you're a vendor, please don't email us saying you want to be on a show talking about pro because we'll right. get that. I've got a girl. I we do the sometimes we do these shows, folks, and you look, look you know, I had a guy wear me out calling, calling, calling because he wanted to talk about the tool he invented on one show. We're we're not we're 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 not doing that. We 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 talk about a couple different outfits, you know, firehouse, fire engineering, fire you know, hooks, fire hooks, fire hooks, <laughs> yeah, fire a hooks. Great friend of the fire service, yeah, very generous know, guy. Fire hooks, you know, with all the tools and and you know, dingus and all them. But but please don't call us if you have like 20 versions of a software program. Well, we're, I guess what I'm saying to the people listening, like we said earlier, figure out what you need ahead of time and what works best for your apartment. You may be so small that you have to use, look, three ring binders have worked just and fine. There's nothing wrong with that. No, and there's nothing wrong with no, that. Like you said, you gave some perfect examples. They're out there. You can make that happen. But it's got to be something, folks, that works for your agency, for your people. That's why I think the three layers we talked about Something simple enough, and I don't mean that in a bad way, simple enough that a company officer can gl glance at, bing, bang, boom, grab some information because they're en route. Something the, the BC can look at that first page, and I'll go to something a little bit more informative with some more details that would actually burden the company officer that only has two minutes or three minutes. Right, right. And then the big, the big, st the stuff that goes beyond that for those large scale instances. Multiple alarm with. resources yeah. and stuff like that. So, you know what? Find a place. Find a system that works for you. Again, whether it's a three ring binder or it's a software program, but make or sure pad or yeah, whatever. It right. makes sure it works for you. But I, I'll say this, and I know you'll agree with this: none of this is going to work unless your people get out and walk the buildings and walk through the buildings. And, and, and I'm glad you said that because I wanted to make one further point. Um, I wrote an article uh, for my back page that talked about know your buildings, and we all know Frank Brannigan said that. That was that's Frank right. Brannigan's words. Know your buildings. I can hear his voice. He was a great guy. He was around the for a long, long time. That's right. However, I wrote an article, and the title of it was Know Your Buildings, and it was about, so what does the volunteer fire department do? We're not on duty. We don't have building inspection on Tuesdays at 2 o'clock in the afternoon because it's not a career department. What do you do? And and you know what? I'm, I'm a lifelong, lifelong volunteer firefighter. I, I joined when I was 18 years old, and I'm 65 now, and I'm still a volunteer firefighter. And, and I made a suggestion. I said, you know what? Even if you're in a little village, even if you're in, in, in Cheney, Kansas, even if you're in Mineola, New York, you know what? There's a hardware store. There's a supermarket. There's a couple of delis. There's a couple of other, other warehouses. You know what? Have the chief or have somebody go to them during the week and say, hi, how you doing? I'm the fire chief here in the Mineola Fire Department. Can, can I talk to the owner or the, or the manager? Yeah, sure. He's right here. You, do you think we could come by on Saturday? What time do you guys go up on Saturday? I want to bring a small group of firefighters here from the fire department. We like to familiarize not ourselves. To inspect. Right. No, no, no. We're not inspecting. We want to come in and be familiar with your building. Maybe even look down at the basement. Maybe even take a quick look up at the roof. Just so if we ever get a call here or an emergency or a fire or a water leak, even in the middle of the night, we're familiar with your building. Like if you open up at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock on Saturday mornings, maybe one Saturday we could come at 7 with our guys and you could open a place up and walk through with, it, with us and give us a little familiarization so we know if we have to come in here, Right where we're going, where your gas shutoff is, where the water valve is, in case you have a, a broken pipe one night or something like that. So, And most of them are going to be very receptive to that idea, even in a volunteer fire department. And then, of course, you can sell that to your people by saying, hey, guys, at the next company meeting, listen, I have it already arranged for two Saturdays from now. Anybody wants to go through the uh, you know, the, the, the Holbert uh, hardware store on Main Street? 
We're going to go through it. It's been there for 75 years. He's going to bring us through the basement and show us all the old tool equipment areas down there. He's going to let us go to the roof. You know, some of us have been there before. Some of us have not. And even if you did five of those a year, you know, it's a, it's a volunteer department. We can't, we can't require too much of you. But if you, if you did five or six of those a year or one a month even, you know what? You, you'd slowly get to be very familiar with and, and pick the buildings that you don't have a lot of exposure to. Right. Everybody's in the supermarket every day. You know what I'm saying? But they're not in the hardware store or in that, that storage facility on, on, on commercial boulevard, right. you know? Right. Um, so another way for even volunteers to quote unquote, know your buildings. Well, buddy, another great show. Another great show. Absolutely. And I hope so. I hope so. I hope it was interesting to our, to our readers. It's not, you know, the, uh, the gung-ho firefighting, uh, you know, stories and, and programs that we do often. But I think equally important, knowing about knowing your buildings and pre-planning and walking through and, and not waiting for the day of a fire to be inside one of the buildings in your district. Well, and I'll, I'll just say, George, thanks for the, uh, for the uh, idea. We've talked pre-plans before, but not, and not, not in this kind of uh, situation where we walk through the different things. So right. hopefully it was good for you. Um, we're hoping that you can tell your friends and, uh, you know, old school, we, we, you know, we have a great time doing it. No agenda, no, no notes, no script, uh, just us having fun talking to you. And if you have ideas uh, like George did, please, please feel free to make suggestions. We're not saying we're going to use them, but if it, if it fits into our program, we think it'd be of interest to the listeners. We'll certainly consider that. Yeah. And don't be, you know, sometimes people make a suggestion, John, and we've already done it, or we, we may not have titled that in that show, but it was covered in a particular. Oh, we may show. do it next year, you know. Yeah, so it's exactly. not saying it's going to happen the, the you know the day we get to exactly. Get it. Right. So, well, folks, we want to thank you once again, uh, John. If they want to get a hold of you, email Chief John Salka at gmail dot com, and I'm Chief Lasky at gmail dot com. Uh, we end all of our episodes, all of our shows with 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 one very important message, and that is this: Please keep the men and women in armed forces in your thoughts and prayers, and remember this: never forgetting means just that, never forgetting. Thank you. We'll catch you next time. Be safe and God bless you. Bye-bye.